couple weeks ago. Did you see the traffic we missed here? I wonder. They shut I-10 down this morning for almost four hours. Wow. Well, I know when I left, there was a lot of traffic coming this That's way. That's exactly what it was. They had uh, was wondering. over by the um, steamboat bills on I-10 mm -hmm. that one of those hotels. Mm -hmm. Shots fired and somebody hold themselves up. Wow. They had it blocked down. Both lanes. Huh? Both lanes, both directions. I mean, both directions. 210 became a nightmare. It was, uh, was they said 171 coming into Moss Bluff was horrid. When I lived here, in, uh, when right. I got to off the spur, to the stop sign on there was the spur, a the traffic going west was just bumper to bumper. Yeah. So, golly, <laughs> I'm going to the floodgates. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, but it was okay the other way. As soon as it. Right. Filtered yeah. out, and I was able to go across. And we missed all that over being over here. We missed all the, all the excitement. All the excitement. Because <laughs> yeah, Philip had called while we were in the middle of talking, and so I didn't answer it. But later I called him back. He said, "Hey, dear," but like, no. I said, "Well, I'll find out here shortly. If I get down in the spur and can't get out, I'll turn around and go back up the road." But yeah, it was I bad. Out, I guess. Huh. I lucked out. I thought I had a, a doctor's appointment and I was supposed to go to the hospital and get a shot. And uh, I, they called me and said, Well, you're not supposed to do that till tomorrow. I went back and looked at my calendar, both the doctor's appointment and <laughs> getting the shot was, uh, was tomorrow. So I, I just got back and just laid back in there. I didn't even notice that this stuff was going on. Good for you, huh? Good for you. Well, you could stay on the city streets. You wouldn't have the I-10 problem. I don't do that, though. Well, you would have to. <laughs> you got to learn to go with the flow. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. If I go down and I see the I-10 all backed up, I'll stay off of it for sure. But that's yeah, it was. Like... I pulled up the Google map, and I didn't trust that. So I looked at the DOTD map. I was like, yeah. and you got to be some frustrated people out there on that road. Mm -hmm. Don't you know it? Oh, I tell you, a, a, a Muslim extremist, he wouldn't have to blow anything up over here, buildings. All he got to do is hit all of our bridges at one time. Mm -hmm. You realize if you took out the Moss Bluff, the West Lake, the Cockshaw River, and the 210, just take them out. Oh. Kinder's, Kinder's little businesses would make a killing because everybody would be having to drive through there to go anywhere. <laughs> and it would. Westlake would have to drive all the way up to the High, to High Hope Road, up to De Quincey to go places. Man, you talk about a... You'd have to bring the ferry back. Oh, you see, make fun of the engineer from Georgia. Wants to turn the old I-10 bridge into a greenscape. Yeah. Plant grass on it and trees and make wow. it a hiking destination. Bad to drive over, so who wants to, <laughs> yeah. who wants to walk or run over? I mean, come on, really? Who would want to walk up, up that, that bridge? Exactly. I know. I'm thinking put an escalator on it, freeze it, and we could have a big slide. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have to make a, what was the name of the snow, the ski, the snow ski deal they had a long, long time ago? Well, I missed that one. Oh, yeah. Oh. Um, Cajun Mountain or something like that. <laughs> it was over there where the BFI uh, dump is <laughs> in uh, in Sulphur, oh, south yeah. of the Interstate. Right. I mean, you could go over there and you could ski down. Really? No yeah. kidding. Yeah. I knew a guy that did it. He was going to go skiing out in Colorado and never practice. had been. Oh. So he went over there and took some lessons. And oh, wow. Yeah. That's interesting. I bet you could build some speed up from the top of that bridge because mm -hmm. you can't do much but go straight down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it doesn't seem like much of a hill up here to contemplate me. I bet if I put you on top of that in a toboggan, <laughs> by the time you got to the bottom, you'd say, give me Pennsylvania any day of the week. <laughs> it's a lot different when you get up on it and look down than when you when you drive across it in your car. I'd have to ride it one time. I can't that. I can't even, it makes me nervous nowadays to even <laughs> drive across it. Just remember, if the bridge breaks, 
beneath your steering wheel. You'll be all right. Just keep your seat belt on, duck beneath your steering wheel. And then don't wait, get out immediately. Get out immediately. Yep. Yeah, don't wait. Have something to bust the window. Roll the window the only way you go in there. Yeah. Oh, there the you go. That's it. There you go. It's salt water. Everything's going to go quit working as soon as uh -huh. you get in it. Yep. And I'll smack that computer in there. When, when I was in high school, when I was in high school, a friend of mine bought a car over in Houston from a relative. So I went with him and his father to pick it up. And I was going to ride back with my friend. And we came to the Calcutta River Bridge, and I'd never seen it. Oh, and man, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we went over. I had nightmares about that bridge. <laughs> for for a week, I would, I would be going up over it, and I, it I'd go across the top, and I'd never touch the ground until I got to the bottom. <laughs> and then I moved here. You know, I just, I, oh, I couldn't believe it. it. <laughs> All you need is that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, really? He could die for his country, now he can be legal when he does it. I was thinking it. <laughs> exactly. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and he, that frustrates him too. You can go in the army with oh, this, this. That was his choice. No, that was no, the fact that he could die for his yep, country. Yeah, that was his choice, though. Yeah, he knew no, that he going in. No, he don't regret going in. Okay. No, he, and he loses his argument. <laughs> matter of fact, he hurt his back in the field. He had to have two steroid shots while they were out there. So, not sure exactly what happened when they actually come back. Into Fort Polk, they'll do some x rays and MRIs to see what happened. Make sure he didn't do anything permanent. Yeah. I fell out of the trees trying to snipe that drone. <laughs> <laughs> there is no telling that. Because Uncle Philip said he brought a slingshot and he was going to smoke it. Uh huh. <laughs> his, one of his sergeants told him yeah. to bring a slingshot for, just for that reason. Oh, really? Uh huh. Because they were having like war games. Mm hmm. And one of the other companies, they have a, a better drone, and they fly that thing all over. And he said it makes them mad. So Slingshot it. Yeah, he said bring it. Mm -hmm. Better ask for forgiveness later. Let's <laughs> <laughs> say pull it out your paycheck. Win, win the war game. <laughs> Should get a raise. <laughs> <laughs> Depend on who the commanding officer yeah. is. Mm -hmm. Apparently, it must not be a high flyer because most of the drones we use, you'll never see them before they don't blow you up. Yeah. Otherwise, if they all had to come down in duck range, man, every duck hunter and goose hunter around be out there just sitting there waiting. Here comes a couple. They don't get close. Don't spook them. <laughs> that could be fun. Or on the other side, I told him somewhere bound on one of those Muslim sites, they'll tell you how to take a garage door opener and convert it into a drone capture. And you aim it at the drone when it gets in that field of range, it shuts it down and it lands. That's how they captured ours with a garage door opener. Mm. <laughs> a garage door opener. Mm. I can't even get my truck. I can do the, the house. Works. Oh. <laughs> That's good. Did our vehicles work that good? Okay, I'm guessing with the exception of Ray, everybody has read the email. And so uh, Calvin is here today. I don't know if you got any more questions. Does anybody have any questions from the email? You didn't get to read it? No. Um, we talked, well, we talked to um, the Christian Ministries group, the um, Mennonites, uh, if they come in, they pay all their utilities. In fact, they said they would be willing to pay rent, and I said, no, we're not looking for rent. If they paid all their utilities, um, the biggest, 
not hiccup, but the biggest thing for us to know is if they come in, they would take control of this half of the gym and they would take complete control of the fellowship hall for the entire time. They bring their own stuff. We remove ours. They don't use anything. Um, when they're done, they replace our stuff um, that we have. They clean everything up and it's like they were never here. What exactly they, like why do they need our? Because uh, the gym would be used for the short-term workers. What we don't see, there's a group that comes here on Sundays. Right. Those are, they're usually here for a month to two months. They they're, the, they're the structural people. Okay. They're making sure they have the equipment, the houses to go to, all that kind of, they're cooks. Okay. Um, what we don't see is the worker, the men that come in on a weekly basis revolving. Oh. And so they would be staying in here. They set up bunks. Oh, okay. And so um, they would bring a shower truck, a kitchen trailer, because our kitchen is not enough to what they need to do. Mm -hmm. um, they're responsible to hook it all up. They would have seven campers out here. Um, they do all the hookups. They, they have a guy that is specifically, that's his job. In fact, he's going to be in Moss Bluff next week. I may not have told you that to come help him tear down. Mm -hmm. And so while he's here to tear down over there, he's going to come look over here and make sure we didn't miss something. So out of our pocket, nothing. The only thing out of our would be an inconvenience mm -hmm. is we can't play basketball and we won't have the fellowship Paul while they're here. And, um, we don't have the church back, so, it goes, huh? so we don't have the church back yet, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but they, they, they don't charge for what they do, the, the people. Um, it is, they just need a place to land, and that's basically what it is. We're giving them the space to land. They take every all the technicalities out of it. They, fight, they hook up their own electric off of ours, water, plumbing. They make what we have work, which is why they're bringing in what they have. And, uh, and they leave without leaving a footprint. I mean, there might be some uh, paths where they walked in the grass because, you know, seven people with the kids, the kids are usually the ones that are here for the month, mm -hmm. those families, because those are the ones that are doing the, the, the leg work, making sure that when the other guys get here, they've got stuff ready just to, to go through. And uh, they like the idea back here, their kids have plenty of room to play. Um, so really it costs us nothing other than maybe the use of some of our facilities. Um, I was hoping there'd be a few more people. I did send out an email, you, and I listed a whole lot of things because I know Lane had a bunch of questions. I think you pretty much answered everything that she had. Um, but I'm hoping to hear from most of the church people so that we can uh, take care of that. Well, it's funny. It never goes off for me until I'm talking. It was relevant to what we're doing. Um, but people are agreeing that they like that idea. So just throwing that out to y'all. Uh, if you figure it out on your phone, you can open up the email and you can read when I sit out. Because uh, I list a lot more stuff than that. Um, they won't be back till November. At the 1st of November, their guy shows up, starts setting up. They all show up right after Thanksgiving. And then they'll be here through April. So they would be able to hook into our electrical system? Electrical and plumbing. They make it work. And they have the skill trade to do it. It's not like they don't bring a plumber in. They have their own, the guy they have, he, that's what he does. Told him this was three phase, this is single phase. He said, no problem. He knows exactly what to do. Um, so it's, it's, it's not his first rodeo. He's used to setting it up. The campers would be evenly spaced. It would look like a small RV park with seven of them. That all be tied into the septic system. Um, they would all have their own water tap, will tap into the, the plumbing as well. Mm -hmm. So, if, but they do all of that. That's all on them. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to come out there with the shovels and dig. I mean, if we wanted to help, that'd be one thing. But nothing is required of us other than here's our space. Um, they'll take over. They'll have a lot of vehicles here during the week. And then on Sundays, their, their equipment trucks will be parked here, so we'll all have to park further out into there. Um, but on Sundays, the only people that remain are that structural group. The men will never see them unless we came up here. To, well, on Sunday, Wednesday evenings, we might bump into them because some of them may come visit just to see what, what we're doing over there. Uh, but typically, we, we wouldn't see the men from Sunday to Sunday. They, they come in, they leave. Southern Baptists do it too. You just don't hear about it a lot. They go set up somewhere and then they bring in, they just rotate through. 
Southern Baptist disaster, we have our own kitchen truck, we have our own laundry truck, a truck full of nothing but washing machines and dryers, uh, a trailer, we have shower trucks, we have all the same stuff. This is just Christian ministries and they need a place to land and to be able to continue helping Moss Bluff, this would be very effective. Alrighty then, if you think of a question asked, or we're going to be in Matthew chapter 1. Yes, Dana. Renee said she didn't want to say what she said. But we did get you, Dana. Matthew chapter 1. And yes, I'm going to read all of these begats. Um, I'm going to give you a heads up if you did look ahead. Verse 17 tells us we're looking at three different sections. But I want you to notice something very particular about verse 1 because normally we wouldn't start a generation this way. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, we expect that because this is his generation. The son of David, the son of Abraham. Who came first? It's not a trick question. Abraham came first. But notice they put the son of David ahead. Jesus is that prophesied son of David that would come. And that's what Matthew wants the Jewish people to see. This is the Davidic Messiah. Then he goes to Abraham. Uh, Abraham was prophet and priest. David was prophet and king. Only Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. Uh, just something fascinating to throw out there. So we begin in verse 2. And this first... Um, Generation runs from uh, first grouping of generations. One runs from Abraham to David. This is what we would know of as the patriarchs. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob begat Judas and Judas, uh, which would be Judah, and his brethren. Judah had eleven other brothers, and Judah begat Perez and Zerah of Tamar. What changed? Something just happened there that was not in verse two. The mom was listed. What do we know about Tamar? Uh, no, she wasn't raped. Um, you're thinking of the other daughter, I think, Dinah. Yeah, she tricked him. Uh, she tricked Judah. Go back a little. Was was Tamar Jew or Canaanite? She's Canaanite. Absolutely fascinating that here in the Davidic lineage or the Abrahamic lineage is a Canaanite woman. And notice, she is the first one that is listed. We normally don't track the women. It's man, son, 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 son. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, boop, Tamar's thrown in. Let's keep reading because it does get interesting. She had two sons, Zerah and Thamar. Uh, Pharez had two, Zerah of Thamar. And Pharez beget Ezram, and Ezram beget Aram, and Aram beget Abinadab, and Abinadab beget Naasen, and Naasen beget Salmon, and Salmon beget Boaz of Rahab or Rahab, I mean, um, yeah, Rahab, Rahab, which is the Rahab of Jericho. Now, all of a sudden, she's not Jewish either. What was her profession? She was a prostitute. So Tamar tricked Judah. Remember what happened to Tamar's first two husbands? They died. And then Judah had told her, oh, when my other son gets older, you can have him to be your husband. And he's like, no, heck, no way. All my, all my sons are dying married to this woman. She's killing them all. She wasn't killing them. Um, so Tamar tricked him because she pretended to be a prostitute. Well, Rahab, she actually is a woman of the town. And from Rahab, uh, Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. So here we have Ruth thrown in. Ruth is not Jewish. She's what? Moabite. She's Moabite. All of these women are women that are supposed to be avoided, but look, God has included by his grace these women into the lineage of Jesus. Worked it right on in. God intended, all the way back from Abraham, that the, Gen the Jews would be a light to the Gentiles. Not that God was a, uh, hated the Gentiles from that respect and liked only the Jews. The Jews were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles 
And here he brings them in. Uh, we've still got one more we're going to find. Um, Jesse begat David the king. And David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. Now she's not listed here by name, but who is she? Bathsheba. God's grace is sufficient. There, there is no uh, doubt when you look at what God is doing here that God is not just angry. He's not an old man in the Old Testament just dumping people off. He is a God of grace and mercy. We see that in the lineage here of Joseph. Verse 7, Solomon begat Reboam. Now here I'm going to give you insight. If you read Luke's genealogy, they split. Because in Luke's, we follow a different genealogy. Jesus um, wasn't born from Solomon. This is Joseph's lineage. Jesus wasn't born of Mary's, uh, well, of Joseph's other lineage. When you count Mary's side in Luke, Jesus was born of Mary. He does not have a patriarchal link to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by man only through the woman. And so if you, if you follow Luke closely here, they split because uh, there was another son other than Solomon that was born, and that is who Luke, in fact, I can tell you, I should have looked it up to tell you what his name was. It won't take me but a second. I can tell you where it divides off. So I can tell you quick. I got to find it first. There we go. Somebody's probably screaming at me on the internet. It's this, it's this. Well, I can't hear you. David beget Nathan. There was a Nathan was David's son. So there's not a mistake. When you're looking at Matthew, you're looking at Joseph's lineage. Luke covers Mary's, and that's why they divide. So no matter which one you come from, Jesus's earthly lineage comes from David, although he does not have a male connection to the throne. He's got it through Mary. So he is a son of David, but he is spirit born, as we're about to see when we get a little further here. Um, once we leave these names, we go through the times of the kings, we get into Babylonian captivity. Most of these names are slightly familiar. If you read the Old Testament, especially First and Second Kings or First and Second Chronicles, um, picking up at verse 7, Solomon begat Reboam, this would be Rehoboam, and Reboam begat Abiah, and Abiah begat Asa, and Asa begat Jehoshaphat, which would be Jehoshaphat. He begat Joram, and Joram begat Ozias, and Ozias begat uh, Jotham, and Jotham begat Ahaz, and Ahaz begat Ezekias. Ezekias begat Manassas. Manassas was not a good king at first. Manassas begat Ammon, and Ammon begat Josias. Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. Now, once we get back from Babylon, most of these names are usually strange to us. Zerubbabel will be one of them that you might be more familiar with, but the rest of these are guys that we would not have known for the most part. Picking up with verse 12, after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias beget Salathiel, Salathiel beget Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel beget Abiad, and Abiad beget Eliakim, Eliakim beget Atzor, and Atzor beget Zadok, Zadok beget Achim, Achim beget Eliud, Eliud beget Eleazar, Eleazar beget Methan, Methan beget Jacob, and Jacob beget Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, is called the Christ. And so, um, as we're about to see, just think in three terms of three sections, from Abraham to David, from David to captivity, from captivity to the time of Joseph or to the time of Jesus. And so in verse 16, um, that Joseph spoken there was the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called, again, King James says, Christ. I've told you enough times you remember what you should say, or at least what you should think. Messiah. This is the Old Testament Mashiach. In Greek, it's Christos. It's Messiah. It's the same thing. Different words for the same person. 
So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14, from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14, and from the carrying away into Babylon under Christ are 14 generations. And so we're able to trace lineage all the way from Dave, Abraham all the way up to Jesus. Luke goes back, oh, how far, do you remember? He goes all the way back to Adam. He traces an entire lineage uh, for that. It's important that he sets this straight because from the earthly point of view, at least from earthly lineage, Jesus is a direct descendant through Joseph of David. And that's what a Jew would like to know. Because if you're not of David, what are you not supposed to be? Not a king. You have to come from Davidic lineage in order to be a king. And so if they call him Jesus, the son of Joseph, at least in the, the regular person's mind, he's a descendant of David, and they should have been able to make that connection there. They don't, for whatever reason, because he comes from Nazareth. Uh, but he was born in Bethlehem, which is the city of David uh, as well. Um, I know Jerusalem, we think of city of David, but Bethlehem is as well. Um, but anyway, picking up verse 18, now we're on a little bit better grounds. If you want to, you can go back and trace the lineage, uh, play with the names, there may be more buried in there. Uh, it's not like Genesis. In Genesis chapter 6, uh, the lineages actually spell out uh, something that's coming. It's, their names actually point to the flood and things that are happening. I know of nothing that feeds out of that way. It's just three succinct groups of people that you're able to trace through historically, and it does give legitimacy to Jesus being a son of David. He says in verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ, Jesus, his given name, Christ again is Messiah. It is not his last name, it's not his middle name. Um, it might be easier for you to supplement the word the, because most of the time it is there, Jesus the Christ. The definite article is there in the Greek. And so what that does is that helps you think in your mind. Um, David Lemire, Ray Yerke, Calvin White, Jesus Christ, <laughs> you miss it. And it's because of our Western idea. But if every time you see Christ, Jesus, the Christ, that gives you a middle note, Christ is looking back to who he is. He's the Messiah. And so um, there are these that are not supplied at various times. There are these that are supplied that you don't see. I think, just me personally, I think it would be better with our understanding of English if we supplied the word the, because it sets it apart. We don't think, you know, it's not G Jesus Christ. Christ isn't his last name. It's Jesus' title. Um, we might say Pastor Luke or, um, well, can't say Dr. Reed, but uh, Engineer Reed, um, doctors at the hospital, Whatever we mean, we put titles usually in front of the name. Jesus, title comes second. Jesus, the Messiah. And that's what Matthew wants us to know. Now, the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, was on this wise when, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, they were engaged, but their engagement is a lot different than our engagement. The engagement was every bit married except for conjugal visits. They didn't have any kind of sexual relationship in the espousal period. They were married. In order to break that that espousal, you had to have a divorce. There was no way out of it. It wasn't like, well, we're only engaged. I gave him his ring back and that's it. That's not Jewish. That's not biblical how they thought. Being espoused, um, a covenant has been made already with her husband usually at her home or at her father's house, the covenant was made, then the man would go off. And some people teach it was a year. Sometimes it may have been a year. Sometimes it could have been six months. And that is the point later on when we get to the parable of the virgins. If it has to be an exact year, what would you know? When to be ready. Exact moment to be ready. But they never knew. It could be six months, nine months. It could be three months. But that espousal period was a time, sometimes when the man would go off and build a home, it was an espousal period. In the back of my mind, I, since we never always have explained why they did their traditions, an espousal period. In the back of my mind, I, since we never always have explained why they did their traditions, 
perhaps if you wait six months, then you'd know she's not pregnant from somebody else's, uh, from another man, that I'm getting a pure life. Uh, various factors focusing in on that, but she is espoused to Joseph. So everything except the act of sexual intercourse, they are considered married. They are joined together. And that's important for what we're going to see later. Notice they were espoused before they came together, meaning sexual, sexually speaking, she was found with a child of the Holy Ghost. So she's pregnant. They're only espoused. And what's everybody going to think? Either he did or somebody else did. Yeah, either Joseph has not acted according to our traditions or Mary's not as chaste as we would like her to be. Neither one of them acceptable in their society. Something happened, though. Look at the timing here. She was found with the child of the Holy Ghost. What are we missing? Did all of a sudden this just pop up? When the angels told him. Who did the angels tell first? Mary. Elizabeth. Elizabeth first. Well, actually, Elizabeth and her husband. Then Elizabeth is going to go to Mary. But when she gets to Mary, what is Mary telling her? Hey, the angel visited me too. So we've got all of that that is between the middle of this verse where they're espoused and then she is found with the Holy Ghost. All of that's implanted right in here. This was not a surprise to Mary. Mary didn't wake up and say, oh, why do I have a bump here? She knows the Holy Spirit came to her. She knows the angel visited her and told her. She said, may your will be done in me. She was a part of that. So if your wife comes to you and you know that you have never slept with her, I'm pregnant, I'm gonna have a baby, his name's Jesus, and there's no man involved. What's the typical man gonna think? Hmm? Has this ever happened before? Mm -mm. Here she is pregnant. Now Matthew lets us know the Holy Spirit came upon her, and so this was not of her loose morals, this is her being faithful to God. She is a chaste woman in God's eyes. But now she has had to have told Joseph because in verse 19, Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. So he understands to some degree that this is of the Holy Spirit, but he doesn't want to be a part of it because what's everybody going to think? They're messing around before they Yeah. Out. Or if he if he bounds and declares, it's not me, it's not mine. And they was home. Yeah, and so he's going to put her away privately. And notice what the scriptures say: he is a just man. Now, according to the law, that would be fine. That would have been quite legitimate if you if you found out that you're married, that your wife had cheated on you. It it. It's more than biblical to put her away, but he is going to put her away privately. He is not going to make a spectacle of her. So now we have Mary, who is, what, what does that mean, put her away privately? Without, yeah, privately, no big fanfare. Typically speaking, you kill her? Or well, you have the option with a wife if she cheated on you, and you take her and the man she cheated with, and you stall them both. So there would never be just one person. You were always stoning two because the idea, the woman would be brought before the, uh, the court. And so if we go back to the Leviticus way, if she denied it, she was giving a drink to drink. And we struggle to understand what it says. But if her thigh is wasted away, she was stoned. She was guilty to death. But there's always two. So we know there was a man. So when the woman that is caught in adultery is brought to Jesus, we should rightly ask her. Where was he at? And so he's going to do it privately in such a manner as to not draw attention to it. He's not going to bring her before a, a public crowd. He's just going to do it as delicately as he can. And he's going to be gone. Now, it's still hard to hide. I agree with you, but he's not going to make a spectacle out of it. That's the, the main idea. He is not going to make a spectacle out of it. I'm not answering your question, am I? Yeah. Is he putting her away secretly as in to live and to get up, get past this? No, putting her away is he's divorced. He's going to divorce her 
and leave her, but he's not going to bring it into the public square to do it, where most of the time that's what you would do. You would bring something like that to the public square, because even if you don't stone her, you want everybody to know what she is, and you get your divorce and you walk away. Um, think of it in this term, when Ruth went to Boaz on the threshing floor, then he had to get the kinsman redeemer. There was a guy between him and her. And so in a public venue that was brought forth, he, that guy had an option. He could have married her, but Boaz reminds him, and you're going to have to give a portion of your, your goods to her child when he's born. And he's thinking, I ain't giving what I got to a Canaanite, I mean, to a Moabite woman. So he takes off his shoe publicly, gives it to Boaz in front of witnesses as a renouncement of his right to marry Ruth. And instead, then when he renounces it publicly, then everybody knows it's legitimate for Boaz to marry Ruth. So there were things that were carried out public manner. We do weddings publicly, but not like they did. Their towns are smaller, and so you brought a lot of things before the city gate, before the public square, and that's where you brought it out. And so could he have, he could have pursued stoning if he had been of the mind. He wouldn't have gotten away with it because he's not even going to get to, to get away with putting her away privately. But the idea is he's not going to make it a spectacle. He's not going to bring it out. He's going to deal with it as secretly as he can. And there would have been people Probably, I mean, you got to think the high priest would have been around. If not the high priest, well, they wouldn't have had a priest there, but there would have been a, a priest. Um, the elders of the city would find out. But it would be like, look, she's saying this is of the Holy Ghost. It's not mine. I don't want anything to do with this. And we're reading into what's going on because the angel's going to show up to, to Joseph and tell him, it's fine, take her. There's not any trouble. He's going to put his fears to rest. So we speculate about his fears. His fears may be, I'm going to lose my name. I'm going to lose my reputation. I'm going to lose whatever. But still, he didn't want to drag her through the mud if it was of the Holy Spirit. Am I closer? Yeah. Okay. It's just not going to make a public spectacle of it. Um, he didn't want to embarrass either one of them. He's more thinking about himself. Yeah. Yeah. And if he doesn't embarrass her, then he doesn't he embarrass, embarrass himself. himself. Because anything he does to her is going to draw attention to himself because right. they are legally married, right. though they don't have the conjugal benefits yet. So everybody knows Joseph and Mary are espoused. If Joseph all of a sudden leaves, something's up. And then a couple months later, she's showing. Everybody really knows what's up. But he's afraid of something. If you look at the next Verse, but while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. Don't be afraid to do that. So whatever he was going on, he, there was fear involved. And he couldn't really rationalize it out. Why, who could? I, like I said, if a woman comes up to her husband today and says, I didn't sleep with a man, this just happened. Or your kid comes home from, from school. Guess what I found out today I'm pregnant. I've never slept with anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's, that's what we're going to think. Um, now, you might say, well, we're technologically advanced. We could do that. You are correct. They, wouldn't have, they didn't have that back then. So he's going to do it in a secretive way. But the angel of the Lord directly appears to him. So we know there's a gap. God didn't go to Joseph and say, is this okay if I do this with your wife? God went straight to Mary. Mary would have told Joseph, and now God's telling Joseph. Mary was willing to endure it before she had the support of Joseph. That's what needs to sink in. When do we want to do something when we have support of people? When people are behind us. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll go talk to my neighbor about Jesus. Will you come with me? Well, no, if Jesus told you to do it, you go do it. Step out, trust me. Mary was willing to embrace all of this before she had the support of her husband. That shows us the, the spirit of Mary. Right? That, that's a big thing. She knows what's coming. She knows what people are going to think. They're wrong. Isn't it hard to be wrong? I mean, right, and people think you're wrong? 
Oh, it is. Man, we want to open our mouth and remove all doubt, right? If you know you're where the Lord wants you, why do you have to do that? Is it not enough just that the Lord says, this is what I have for you? That's what Mary does. Again, she doesn't have the support of Joseph till this point. She's already, she's already seen uh, Elizabeth. She knows what's going on. Joseph is the last to know. She's okay with it. I think that'd be hard for me. Just to do something. Or, let me say it this way. Some people have said, well, you're the pastor. Can't you do what you want with the Mennonites? Not really. That'd be foolish for two reasons. The way we are organized as Westside Baptists, as Southern Baptists, we are congregational in our decisions. I'm not a CEO. I'm not top down. Now, where we typically draw the line is we don't tell Brother Luke what he can preach or can't preach or what he must preach. Now, you sit there with your Bible and you see if what he is preaching is in line with the word. But when it comes to decisions that affect the church, while you may say, but I trust him to make the right decision. Well, I've heard that before. And when Luke makes decisions, some people don't like them. So it does work better when everybody's like, we are in agreement. So, you know, 15 people are saying, I ain't giving up my gym. OK, then we got an issue on our hands. But it's not going to be just a decision that I arbitrarily make. And it's because now let me make sure I make this clear. If God come to me tonight and sat on the side of Luke's bed and said, Luke, I am with the Mennonites. Don't you hold anything back. A whole different ball game. But he hasn't done that. But he did show to Mary. And she is convinced. She's, she's a woman of virtue. Joseph thinks on things. He's dwelling on it. This is not a decision he was going to make lightly. God shows up, which helps us understand. He wasn't doing what he was doing out of hate. He wasn't doing it out of spite. And when God says to him in a dream, Joseph, thou son of David, notice he included that again. Joseph is the son of David. Fear not to take unto you Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Joseph, this isn't an earthly man's doings. This is heavenly. This is all about what God is doing. He tells him in verse 21, she shall bring forth a son, not you. You're not going to beget. Notice back up in the verses ahead of here. Abraham beget Isaac. Isaac beget Jacob. It's not going to say Joseph beget Jesus. Mary beget Jesus. Supposed of Joseph. She shall bring forth a son. And notice, and you, Joseph, shall call his name Jesus. Now, in the, uh, I have no idea why they capitalized it. It's the same Greek word. It's a Jesus. Um, why is Jesus so different from Joshua? And it's simply our pronunciations. In the, in the Greek, Joshua would not be a hard J. It would be Yah, Yahashua. So Jesus is Jesus. It's, it's, it takes an air coming out, Jesus. And normally, most of us in Greek don't even say it that way. We just say Jesus. But it's Jesus. So you hear that J-ish sound in there. His name does mean Savior, but Savior is not a transliteration. Uh, Jesus is, is his name. Savior is what he will do. Luke is my name. I'm a light bearer. In some cases, I do make lights come on, but it's not what I'm known for all the time. Jesus, though, his name is going to mean Savior. God saves. And so every time you see Jesus, you should be thinking God saves, not just, oh, that's his name, Jesus. No, he's God saves the Messiah, Jesus Christ. God saves the Messiah. And how is he going to save his people? Through the Messiah. That's how he was going to do it, not through a man-made arbitrary way. He is going to bring salvation to his people through Jesus. And he tells us why he calls him that. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now, I like this. You shall call, uh, she shall bring forth the son. It's not up for debate, Joseph. You shall call his name Jesus, Joseph. That's a command. And he shall, 
save his people from their sins. There's no doubt on the angel of God's part, is there? This is what's going to happen. This is, this is decreed by God. This is determined by God. Now get in line, Joseph. And I'd say this, if God decrees and declares something, you better get in line with it because it's going to happen. And then you can disagree, and it's still going to happen, and you're going to be the worst off for it. But if he says this is going to happen, get in line. It's going to happen. Um, those who persevere unto the end shall be saved. That's it. There is no middle ground. That's, that's the way. God has declared that. He has decreed that. No man, Jesus said, no man comes unto the Father but by me. That's a straight decree. That is the only way it would happen. The angel here, he's not asking Joseph for permission, and he's not asking Joseph to give his approval. Joseph, here's what's happening. And it is to encourage him, though, because he is afraid. Now, if we're wondering why all of this was done, verse 22 says, Now, all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, and this is from Isaiah um, chapter 7, Behold, a virgin shall be with a child. That, that ought to just stand out. Virgins don't have babies. If she sleeps with her husband, she's not a virgin. That's why Mary ceases to be a virgin. She has Jesus, but then what does she do? She sleeps with Joseph and she has other children. She is not a perpetual virgin. A virgin gets married, sleeps with her husband. She's not a virgin anymore. She can have a baby, but here we are, we're supposed to be scratching our head. A virgin shall be with a child. How in the heck is that going to happen? Well, we're left with only one option, really. What is it? Must be God's going to do something. She will... Be with child, she will bring forth a son. It's pretty confident, huh? I mean, you have two options, right? It can be born a boy or it can be born a girl. And what does the prophet say? Son is, is declared, it's decreed. And they shall call his name Emmanuel. The E and the I don't see any difference. If your Bible has I, Emmanuel, that's okay if you see Emmanuel in your hymn book with an I or an E, they're both the same. It's just part of the, the transliteration process. And what does Emmanuel mean? He tells us God with us. So now, if we are following Matthew, based upon what the angel, is, angel of the Lord has told Joseph, what Mary is, has happening to her, what are we supposed to think when we see God saves the Messiah? What are we supposed to think? God is with us. And that is what the Pharisees struggled with. How can you be before Abraham was? Well, there's only one way he could be before Abraham was, and that must be he is who? It's got to be God. <laughs> well, he tells us here, according to Isaiah, a virgin will bring forth a child. She did. They will. Uh, he will be a son. He was. They will call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us, and all of this happens, not really while he's asleep. Matthew gives us some side notes, and I don't want you to think of that in verse 24. Um, it's very possible that 22 and 23 happened while he was sleeping. Some scholars see it as Matthew giving us an aside. Are you following me? It could be that Matthew said, well, here's why all of this is happening, because God decreed this. It doesn't make it any less authoritative some people see verses 22 and 23 as the angel saying, now, Joseph, here's why it all happened this way. Um, I don't know that he would quite speak of that in that nature. Um, it is inspired by, inspired by God, and it could be that the angel did give Joseph a history lesson. It's quite possible he needed a history lesson. Uh, it is for our benefit, but it's what Joseph does, which is most important. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him. If nothing else was written about Joseph, he was a good man. Why? God spoke and Joseph did. He obeyed. He here's the always oh, D was here. I hope D's watching. He hearkened. Means to hear and obey. It's a both and. Um, 
That's what we mean as adults when we look at our kids or our grandkids and say, do you hear me? Well, we know they hear us. We're trying to get them to do what we told them to do. Maybe you said that in the class before you were teaching. Are y'all hearing me? Well, you don't mean do your ears pick up on the vibration. What you mean is, why aren't you doing what I'm telling you to do? Hearing means you obey. Joseph does that. Now, before we ask for an angel of God to appear to us, what might be different about Joseph's scenario in our lives? There's a, be a glaring difference. We know the rest of the story. <laughs> Joseph is, Joseph's at the front of it. He's about to live it. We know it. So if the Lord does speak to us, it shouldn't be a matter of if we walk. Joseph, he did what the Lord told him to do. He took unto him his wife. In other words, what's everybody going to think now? Completely married. They are completely married. But notice verse 25. He knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. He waits to consummate the marriage until after Jesus is born because this child is something totally other than. And now is he no longer worried about his reputation? He's not. In his own home, him and Mary both know what's going on. His fear has been relieved. There is no reputation to protect because it's God's reputation, not Joseph's. And that's what causes us a lot of trouble. When you obey God, it's not your reputation that's on the line. It's his. And when we disobey, we besmirch his name. We would besmirch his reputation. You don't hear people say, Man, they bring a bad name to God, though that's what's happened. What do we hear? That's a pathetic excuse for a Christian. Well, a Christian ought to be synonymous with a proper child of God. God's person. And much more, and I, I probably, this is anecdotal, but I think that who you're offspring of means less today than it did 40 years ago less than it would have done 40 years before that because it used to be oh you're so and so son and everybody knows me got to behave here nobody cares anymore um, and i'm speaking anecdotally the bigger the city the easier it is to blend in and, and sometimes in the big city nobody even cares but it used to be your name stood for everything that was so if i'm jesus the son of Blah, 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 blah. David? That's important. Blah, 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 blah. Abraham? Who you were the offspring of was tremendously important, but Joseph's no longer concerned about that. He put, even if he had physical desires for Mary, he puts that off to the side until she brings forth her firstborn. Side note. This verse would be totally irrelevant if Mary remained a virgin. Look at this verse very closely. He didn't know her till she had brought forth the firstborn son, and meaning what? After that, he knows her. Did the, any, the angel didn't tell them not to. Well, if he or, did, it wasn't recorded. It wasn't recorded, okay. Because I didn't remember him hearing yeah, you no, know, you would be correct. We we don't have it recorded. If the angel told him it was not passed on to us. But he does not know her right. until this takes place, until she brings forth her firstborn. Now if she had only one child, what would have been said there? Her, son. her only son. But Jesus is going to be the firstborn for her. There are others to follow. Later on they're going to show up outside the place where Jesus is and Mary's going to be with her family. Jesus, your family's outside. They thought he was cuckoo. They were trying to clear some stuff up. And he said, these are my mother. These are my brothers. Not them out there. Well, they were, but that wasn't his point. My point is he had other brothers and sisters, but they came after. Mary was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is her firstborn because she has other children after him. And he called his name Jesus. 
He did what he was told to do. Well, I wish I could say that about my relationship with God all the time. Luke did what he was told to do. I wonder how life would have changed, worked out. Man, wrap your head around that. But that's a lot we can learn from Joseph. Once he heard from God, he put his reputation aside. Mary had already put her reputation aside for God's glory. Now Joseph puts his reputation aside for God's glory as well. And what a testament that it says. And he called his name Jesus. He didn't change it. He called his name what he was told to call his name. And Jesus means God saves. Thoughts, comments, or questions up to this point? Don't go into chapter two. We'll deal with the wise men next week. And we won't sing We Three Kings. I always think how, how Mary felt knowing that she was the chosen one that took Carrie. It, it, it certainly was. Absolute, uh, actually, Dennis, no. Dennis's question was, um, was this the first case of parents knowing the gender of their child before it was born? No, because uh, jo uh, John's mom and dad knew what was going to be born as well. I'd have to go back and look. I think there were some others that were prophesied who would come from there, but I do know that John the Baptist's parents knew. Um, but with Mary, that, again, we always, we want to have support. She was willing to step out just because God said so. And she had the prophecy that hadn't been fulfilled yet, so she knew that could be her. Oh, and if God, if the angel of God shows up to you, yeah, yeah, because they were looking forward to this prophecy that had already been given. But even then, still knowing, I'm a single, well, I'm a married woman in an espousal period, and I'm going to end up pregnant. So some people look at the fact that um, she went to see Elizabeth as being part of what helped because it got her out of town, especially when she would be starting a show. That's possible. I mean, that's extra biblical, and so I wouldn't, I wouldn't draw a sword on it and die on a heel. But there's quite a possibility there's some relationship to that. Um, what about being espoused, and if neither her nor Joseph acted any kind of different, would anybody say anything? Well, if they explained it to the parents and the parents were God fears, then most of them would probably believe. I mean, just general, just a regular husband and wife that's espoused and decide, you know what? Well, if there was a couple at Moss Bluff that came up and said, this was this child born of, of God, what would we all do? No, I'm talking about in general, like not, not to do with Jesus. I'm talking about their espoused and they get pregnant. Have they already consummated their marriage or is there... Bashing on the head because they didn't wait six months. Oh, no, no. They would not be stoned. No. So they they looked at it as consensual. Correct. If Joseph, well, now you have consummated the marriage. So now we can't know if she's messed around on you. It's going to be yours. Correct. Yeah. It, they're not That's obligated it. to stone them. If Joseph had accused her of adultery, yes. Yeah. Um, but but if he did not, then no, they didn't just automatically take them out because they are espoused. I mean, it's quite interesting, though. It does create a dilemma. There wouldn't be anything different here than there was with Tamar, Rahab, and Bathsheba. <laughs> I mean, it's just, but the difference being Mary was as pure as the driven snow mm -hmm. when the Holy Spirit came to her, when, when the angel came to her and told her what was going to happen. And so was Joseph. He was a just man. I'm just wondering how easy it would be for us to be willing to put our reputation aside so that God's reputation could be magnified. Well, I would say it's the exercise of extraordinary faith. Uh, uh, yes. Both of them did because, because they believed God, but the, James says it's a faith that works, and Joseph did. He obeyed. Mary obeyed. Uh, it's astounding. We know the rest of the story. But to have this start right off the top with your life, I, I'm just, I'll be honest, I'll be like, oh, you're asking me to swallow a lot. <laughs> but they believe by faith. Now, I, I think if an angel came to us, it might change our mind a little bit. I mean, if you sit and talk to an angel, you would have to be stirred something. Uh, Mary went to visit Elizabeth, and Zachariah couldn't talk. 
So, I mean, he saw the angel too. He saw the angel too. He's not talking. And when she shows up, what happens with Elizabeth? John leaps. John leaps in her belly. I mean, there's all kind of stuff along the way to, to encourage Mary. You're absolutely correct. But to be willing up front to say, be it unto me, I'm your handmaid. That's challenging. Challenging to me, anyway. Mm -hmm. That's tough. All right. Nobody asked. Yeah. Let me make sure. I see two big things over there now. 14 supposedly represents salvation, deliverance, and her spiritual perfection. The three sets of 14 years. Could it be happenstance? Could it? Uh, no. And I didn't get hard into the 14 uh, generations. And if you want me to really get it hard into those 14 generations, you're going to have to show up in person next week, and you're going to have to bring something and put on the table with me to be able to discuss that with you, okay? <laughs> it's one of those things, it's better if everybody comes prepared to discuss it. And I'm not trying to, to, to cop out, it's just I would open a bigger can of worms than we could fish with in any given period. So if other people bring stuff to the table, then I'm willing to go there. If that makes sense. And she's probably shaking her head. We can't see the. She's probably like, oh, I knew you wouldn't answer that question. All right. Hopefully, we'll see each other again next Wednesday night. We'll start with chapter two. I encourage you to go ahead and read through it. Um, normally, we only see this at Christmas time, but I think it's good to see it out of the time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and what it records about Joseph. Lord, certainly he had his doubts at first, he had his fears. But when he hears about your plan, when he knows what his plan includes with his wife, with the future son, he obeys you. Father, I pray that within our own lives would we be found such humble obedience. Lord, may we not require an angel Father, I pray that within our own lives would we be found such humble obedience. Lord, may we not require an angel to tell us what you and your word have already spoken to us. So for certain things, Lord, and, and it's, it's a verse that I remind myself a bunch of times with, Jesus has promised to never leave me nor forsake me, then I can depend on that. I can get up and I can do what I'm supposed to do because I know Jesus is right there with me. Father, there are greater things than that that you have called me to walk in obedience to. And I pray that within my life, I pray that within the lives of those that are here, that we would see Joseph as a challenge to take up that mantle of faith, to believe you, to trust you with our reputations and see what you're going to do with our lives. We thank you for this hope and we thank you for the power of Jesus Christ at work within us to accomplish your will and your way. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen. Amen. She, didn't answer that. she didn't like my cop out. Not really. <laughs> Not really.